Guten Tag. In prior videos, we explored how to apply the laws and rules of Boolean algebra to simplify equations. Sometimes it got messy. The equations occasionally expanded to become very large. Other times we forgot to include a complement. Surely there's a more efficient way. For equations that have three or four input variables, that easier way is Carnot maps, also called K maps. If K maps are more efficient, then why did we learn the Boolean algebra rules first? Those rules are mathematically rigorous and explain why simplification steps are logically true. If we jumped straight to K maps, then we could successfully simplify equations, but we wouldn't understand why. In other words, the Carnot maps would be a black box that magically produces an answer. But now we know the secrets inside that black box. Let's explore the foundations of K maps and how to apply them to three variable equations in sum of products form. Let's say we are given this truth table and asked to find the simplest Boolean equation for Q. One approach that we learned already is to write the function in canonical SOP form and then simplify using the rules of Boolean algebra. That works, but is time consuming. It would be quicker if we could find a pattern and take advantage of it. Pause the video and examine this truth table. Are there any patterns you notice between the input and output variables? Q appears to go 1100-1100. This looks the opposite of input Y. In fact, we can see that every single time y equals 0, then q equals 1. And also, every time y equals 1, then q equals 0. In other words, q equals y prime. It is important to note that I can only write this equation because it is true on every single row. If there were any exceptions, the equation would not hold. Unfortunately, not all patterns are as easy to see as this one. Carnot maps provide us a systematic way of identifying the patterns. Once you learn this approach, it will generally be quicker than algebraic simplification and more reliable than hoping for a quick pattern to jump out. A K-map is simply a strategically organized truth table. Here, we see a blank three input K-map. Notice how the truth table has eight rows and the K-map has eight squares. Each square corresponds to one row in the truth table. Notice how the inputs for the top row have x, y, and z all equal to zero. This top left corner of the k-map represents the case where x equals zero, y equals zero, and z equals zero. What does q equal in that row? q equals one, so we fill in a one to that square. The next row has inputs x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 1. That corresponds to this square of the k-map. Notice how we can read the inputs of 0, 0, 1 from the row and column labels. And the output is 1 in that row of the truth table, so we fill in a 1 in the k-map. We can continue this process of translating the truth table to the k-map. In the rows where q equals 0, we could fill in a zero to the k-map, or we could leave it blank. Both ways mean the same thing. Personally, I prefer to leave them blank because it saves time, and it makes it easier for me to identify groups of ones. But you can certainly write the zeros if you wish. Note that the yz values are written in gray code across the top. This is not a straight binary count. It goes 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, one zero. A very common mistake is to switch the last two headers. So be careful when drawing your own k-maps. But why do we arrange the k-map in gray code? This is the whole strategy behind k-maps. It ensures that only one bit changes between any adjacent squares. By adjacent, I mean moving left and right or up and down. Squares that are diagonal from each other do not count as adjacent. Let's look at this square, which holds the place for minterm one. The input code is 0, 0, 1. If we move down from there, minterm five has the input code of 101. 
So the x value changes, but y and z remain the same. Similarly, if we move to the right, minterm 3 has the input code of 0, 1, 1. Here the y value changes, but x and z remain the same. This applies even to squares on opposite edges of the map. Between M0 and M2, only one bit changes. And the same is true between M4 and M6. This is called wrap around adjacency. Be on the lookout for this as we move forward. Continuing our example of the K map with all the ones in the left half, our next step is to identify groups of ones. Groups must be composed of adjacent squares that all hold a one, no blanks allowed. The group size must be an integer power of two, so the only options are one, two, four, and eight. A single one on the K-map may be included in multiple groups. There are no examples of this here, but we'll see some later. And our goal is to identify the largest groups possible. The bigger the groups, the simpler our final equation will be. Over the next couple slides, I will show the same example, but with two different groupings. The most efficient example is what I should do because it uses the largest possible group. We'll see that this other example does still produce a logically identical equation, but is less efficient. After identifying groups, we write the product terms associated with that group. For each group on a K-map, look at the inputs to all of the squares in that group. For any input variables that change values, do not include them in the product term. For any input variables that hold a constant value throughout the group, do include them. If that variable equals zero, then write it complemented. If that variable equals one, then write it without the complement. Let's apply that to our ongoing example. I asked myself, does x change values within this group of four? Well, for this square, x equals zero, and for this square, x equals one. x does change values, so we drop it from the product term. Next, does y change values within this group? No matter which square I look at, y always equals zero. Therefore, y will be part of the product term. Should it be written as y or y prime? Since y equals 0, then it is y prime. Finally, does z change values? For this square, z equals 0, and for this square, z equals 1. z does change values, so it drops. All I'm left with is y prime. That is a very simple product term indeed. In the less efficient example, there are two groups, and each group gets its own product term. In the leftmost group, x equals 0 up top and x equals 1 down below. Therefore, x changes and so it drops out. But in both squares, y equals 0, so y prime becomes part of the product term. Also, in both squares, z equals 0, so z prime is part of the product term. In total, the term is y prime, z prime. For the second group, x changes so it drops out y is always 0, so we include y prime. And z is always 1, so we include z, no prime. Thus, the product term is y prime z. Now we reach the simplest and final part of the Carnot map method, writing the equation. Since we have product terms already, we reach SOP form by ORing each of the product terms together and setting it equal to the output variable. In our most efficient example, the equation is simply q equals y prime. Good news! That is the same equation we found from the visible pattern on the first slide. In the less efficient example, the equation is q equals y prime z prime or y prime z. Note how each group becomes a product term, and those product terms are ORed together. Both of our k-maps produce logically identical equations. In fact, in this equation, we can algebraically factor out y prime, then z or z prime equals one, and the result is q equals y prime. But we obviously would prefer to jump straight to the simplest equation. We do that by making the largest possible groups of ones.
the smaller the groups, the more specific the expression must be, which means more variables. Let's zoom out to the big picture of what KMAPs do for us. In this simple example, we were able to visually see that Q is the opposite of Y. In the KMAP, that pattern reveals itself by having the ones grouped together. Why does the group appear in the KMAP, but not in the truth table? Because of the fact that only one bit changes between adjacent squares. In other words, all similar terms will appear next to each other, no matter if they are similar in regards to variables X, Y, or Z. That's pretty nifty, and it allows us to find patterns that are more complex than we would see visually from a truth table.